Me and my wife, we started again. And uh, we started a charity called Kintsugi Hope. And Kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. So if we get a bowl and we break it, we tend to mend it with super glue and we hide the cracks. We pretend it's all okay. Or if we're really honest, we probably chuck it away. But what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful for being broken. It certainly becomes more unique. There isn't a bowl like that on planet Earth. Good morning. It is um, such a privilege to be here with you this morning. And, uh, and again, can I just say, you guys are the most generous bunch. You really, really are. We are so grateful for all your support. So I wanted to start by telling you a very simple story. Now, um, when I was a kid, I had a favorite TV program. And my favorite TV program was Flipper. Put your hand up if you remember Flipper. Flipper was flipping brilliant. That's what Flipper was. And, uh, and I used to love this. For those who don't know, it's a dolphin. And the dolphin, they always seem happy, don't they? And, uh, and he would swim around and he'd high five people and he'd flip people up. And, and I thought, you know, I'd always love to have that experience of maybe swimming with dolphins. It would be incredible. And so a number of years ago now, my wife arranged for us all to go abroad. I've got four children and we've never taken them abroad before, never been able to afford it. We thought, let's do it because we want to give dad that magical experience of swimming with dolphins. And so we got to the boat. I was really, really excited, a little bit nervous. And we got on the boat with all the other guests and uh, when we were in Egypt, and then we went out for an hour and a half to where dolphins might be. And as I got on the boat, I haven't been on a boat for about 25 years, right? I suddenly remember I get really, really seasick. This may not be the best idea in the world, but you know when you've spent a lot of money on something, you're going to force yourself to enjoy it. And so I'm there, and then the instructor, um, the lifeguard instructor, me and my son Daniel called him Aquaman because he was a great swimmer, and he said, right, all the adults that want to swim with dolphins, come here, quick, they're in the water. And so we all went over to the Aquaman, uh, the instructor, and then, the true story, he went around all the adults, and he asked them a question, do you want a life jacket? And the first adult went, nah, nah, I don't need a life jacket, I'm a strong swimmer. Second person, no, I don't need a life jacket. I'm a a strong swimmer. And he went around every single adult. I was the last adult that he came to. And me, you know, and every single adult refused the life jacket. And I saw that my my two older kids were going to come in with me. My two younger kids were going to stay on the boat with their mum. And I was thinking, I don't want to look stupid. But, you know, I'm a man of integrity. I'm a man of faith. And a man of honesty that's written a book called Honesty Over Silence. So I said... I don't need a life jacket. I'm a really strong swimmer. And then he suddenly went, jump. Everyone started jumping in. Daniel, Kezia, they jumped in. And you know the snorkel, right? You know, the whole idea of a snorkel is like you breathe out of the snorkel. So when I hit the water, for some reason, I decided to breathe in. And so now my lungs are filling up with water. And I'm thinking to myself, even in this sort of state where I'm drowning, I'm not going to miss this magical experience. It cost me a lot of money. So my head bops up. What I really should do now is shout for help. But instead of doing that, I put my head back down to try and see the dolphins. And I'll tell you what, three dolphins raced on past. They didn't smile. They didn't wave. They didn't flip me up. There was none of that. And I thought, well, that's a really magical experience. Thanks ever so much. But at this point, I'm really starting to panic. And I can really, my heart is racing. And I'm thinking, I'm going to drown. I'm going to have to shout for help. How embarrassing. And then I saw my wife and my two kids on the boat. And I went, I know what I'll do. Is I'm going to wave to them subtly like this. And they'll go, oh, my goodness, dad's not a good swimmer. He hasn't got a life jacket. Quick, get the lifeguard over. 
So there I am. I've spotted them. They've spotted me. And I'm going like this. And then like, Diane's going, look, there's daddy. He's waving. He's loving it. Let's wave back. And then, this is the true story. She gets my iPhone out and starts filming. I'm like, you silly person. I'm drowning. What are you doing? And then... I think there's nothing for it. I'm going to have to shout for help. This is so embarrassing. So I shout out, help! With that, the instructor threw me the ring of shame. <laughs> the ring that says you're not good enough. The ring that says you should have taken a life jacket. The ring that says, you know, you're not as strong as all the other parents. And I grabbed hold of it for all it's worth. And I don't know how this happened, but on the ring of shame ended up right next to me was my son, Daniel. And he looked at me and he said, all right, dad. Uh, I was like, shut up, shut up, shut up. And then he went, dad, swimming with dolphins is pretty stressful, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. And, but the interesting thing was um, the instructor, I expected him to go, you idiot, you white people, you think you can come over here and you can swim in our waters and, you know, you know, you don't take a life jacket, you think you know it all. But he didn't say that at all. He said this, breathe. Good advice. It's going to be okay. You're all right. Actually, it's really tough swimming in, old, in open water. We're going to get you to a safe place. You're going to be okay. And he totally blew me away by his response. Uh, when I got back on the boat, I ran to the toilet. Uh, it wasn't pleasant. It was coming out both ends. Too much information. So I... And I remember sitting on the toilet and I thought three things. Number one, dolphins are arrogant. <laughs> I never want to see a smiling dolphin again in my life. Number two, in three or four days, I am doing a lecture on anxiety. Ironic. And number three, I'm going to get this into a preach somewhere, and no doubt. <laughs> but, you know, the thing was this, is I started to think, why did I react so badly? And, you know, there are lessons to be learned. Who can relate to this slide that's coming up here? Anyone relate to this slide? Put your hand up if you can relate to that. Anyone? It's true, right? And so I started thinking, life doesn't always go to plan. The perfect experience of what I was expecting didn't happen. And so I asked myself some pretty hard questions. Why didn't I use a life jacket? Because I didn't want to look stupid in front of my children. And it was my pride, actually. My pride can be a big issue sometimes. I didn't want all the other dads and the parents to know that I was the weakest swimmer there. And you know, if I'm honest, and I'm going to be honest with you this morning, I hope that's okay. I feel the same about my mental health sometimes. I didn't tell anyone that I struggle really badly with anxiety at times because of my pride, because everyone, I don't want you to think that I'm a really weak and all the other speakers are super. So I struggle and I keep people at a distance and I get disappointed with myself. Why did it take me so long to ask for help? Because I live sometimes by the shoulda, the woulda, the coulda. I should be okay. I ought to be all right. I must pull myself together. That's what I do. And then what really blew me away was the instructor. I was expecting judgment and what I got was empathy. It's all right. Breathe. It's going to be okay. We're going to get you to a safe place. And I don't know where you are at today in your Christian walk, but I hope that you can hear those words. That if you're struggling, it's okay. It's all right. Breathe. We're going to get there. It's going to be right. Struggling doesn't make you a failure. It makes you a human being. And sometimes, you know, when you go through difficult times, it feels like you're drowning, doesn't it? I know when my mental health really dipped, the only way I can describe it is it feels like a roller coaster. And I'm going down the roller coaster and I'm hoping at some point it's going to go back up. But I just don't know when that's going to happen. And I'm out of control and my stomach just feels weird. And, I, and, I, and I'm praying hard. I'm doing everything I can, but I just can't stop it. And it's frightening. But what I've realized over the years is, you know what? 
this, the answer to the issues that we face is always surrender. You see, if I carried on thrashing around in the sea, I probably would have taken everyone else down with me, wouldn't I? That I had to surrender. To find your life, you're going to lose it. You know, the slogan for today is become, don't be a boss, be a child. I had to surrender to what was going on. And as I looked at this passage, three things came into my mind that I hope will be helpful for you. And, um, and the three things were, one is that we need to learn to give up control. We need to learn to surrender. Secondly, is we need to think small. And thirdly, is we need to think differently. Verse 38 says this, and anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In other words, our allegiance is always to Jesus. It's always to Jesus. If you want to find my life, you need to lose it. If you want to be rescued, you need to surrender. So worried about our reputation, so worried what other people think of us. This is a great quote from Richard Raw. He says this, so true. The Christian path becomes less about climbing and performance and more about descending, letting go and unlearning. Knowing and loving Jesus is largely about becoming fully human, wounds and all, instead of ascending spiritually or thinking we can remain unwounded. The ego does not like this fundamental switch at all. So we keep returning to some kind of performance principle, trying to climb out of the messy incarnation instead of learning from it. And, you know, the thing is, when we do surrender, is God is far gentler with us, a bit like my instructor, than, than, than I ever expect. Because gentleness is strength. Gentleness is countercultural. L.A. Cross said this, do not underestimate the power of gentleness because gentleness is strength wrapped in peace. I love that phrase, strength wrapped in peace. And there lies the power to change the world. I think there's two big fears that I know that I have to surrender on a daily basis. Um, number one fear is that I'm not enough. And then my number other thing I need to surrender is that, oh my goodness, everything rests on me. And I realise that I'm not the rescuer. You know, I can't take other people's pain on. I realise that the only way we can come is to go, God, Jesus, if I'm going to find my life, I'm going to lose it and I'm going to give it all to you. And, you know, sometimes that might mean for some of us, can I humbly say, surrendering our our views. And I know sometimes in the evangelical world, there's so many debates about theology of sexuality, theology of this, theology of that. And and these are important debates to have. But I can I humbly suggest that sometimes it's more important to love than to always be right. You see, gentleness is strength. I'm not the rescuer. Sometimes it might mean um, surrendering our timetable because we're always in a rush, right? Now, Spring Harvest 2023, this is your chance to be honest with me here this morning because I've been honest with you and I want complete honesty from every single person in this tent, okay? I'm going to ask you a question and you have to put your hand up if this has happened to you. I don't want anyone bottling out at this point. Are you ready? Please put your hand up if you've ever been on a speed awareness course. Oh, my goodness. Just look around, ladies and gentlemen. That is the biggest response of the week so far. Keep your hand up if you've been on two speed awareness courses. I don't know how to keep going. Free speed awareness courses. We still have hands in the air, ladies and gentlemen. Am I going to go for the fourth? I might as well, might I? Four speed awareness courses. We have a winner. Everyone, please avoid this lady as you leave um, Skegness today. It's not going to end well. But you know what? I do that with so many people and like, we're all too busy, right? 
We're all too busy. We're all trying to do too much. We have to surrender our timetables to God. More is not always more efficient. And we've got to learn this lesson. Um, Second thing, think small. I'm going to read from the message version because I think it really captures this bit. Accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone's help. This is the large work I've called you into. Don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cup of cool water to someone who is thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. And, you know, I'm really challenged by this because I go around speaking at a lot of different stuff, a lot of different conferences. And if I'm honest with you, I hear people like me stand on platforms like this. And sometimes it's always about the big and the spectacular. And, you know, and don't get me wrong, you know, I, we, I love events like this. You know, festivals are so important, aren't they? Um, the Jewish people went to Jerusalem three times, a part of a bigger picture. But, you know, sometimes I think in the church that what we've done is we've valued the big churches, where actually what we should be doing is valuing the small churches, the people that are there week in and week out. There's lovely people who serve week in and week out with no big band, with no massive fan for all but they love and serve Jesus and they go and visit the poor and the broken and the marginalized and their church is the hub of the community for me that's what church is all about it's not a show and some of us will be going back to that and somehow like all our speakers are from big not at spring harvest but generally they're, they're the big churches that get to speak but you know the guys that serve in the choir they're the ones that we should be celebrating David Orr says this, this is a great quote. The plain fact is the planet doesn't need more successful people, but it does desperately need more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, lovers of every kind. In these people who live well in their places, in these people of moral courage, willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And all these qualities have little to do with success as we've defined it. It's interesting, isn't it? When Jesus described the kingdom of God, he described this flip, this upside down kingdom as a mustard seed. It says in Matthew, doesn't it? Matthew 13, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it was the smallest of seeds, when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds come and perch in its branches. About six years ago now, I was um, running, I guess, a reasonable sized charity. Um, we were getting visits from um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Hope you caught those names as they dropped there. And, uh, you know, in and out, and I'm attending loads of media and all that sort of stuff. And I felt God say, big staff team, it's time to let it go. And I was like, I don't really want to let go. And because, you know, um, I've spent 22 years getting it to where it is. And you know that verse, I think it's in Zechariah, isn't it? Do not despise the beginning of small things. And I just felt God say, I'm breaking your heart for something else. I'm breaking your heart for the whole area of mental and emotional health. Because you know what? Suicide is the biggest killer of young men in this country. And we don't talk about it enough. And there's a big difference between mental illness and mental health. And we all have to invest in our mental health, the way you'd invest in your physical health. And sometimes in the church, we need to have an honest conversation. And so to cut a really long story short, me and my wife, we started again. And uh, we started a charity called Kintsugi Hope. And Kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. So if we get a bowl and we break it, we tend to mend it with super glue and we hide the cracks. We pretend it's all okay. Or if we're really honest, we probably chuck it away. But what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful for being broken. It certainly becomes more unique. There isn't a bowl like that on planet Earth. And I'm a firm believer that beauty comes out of brokenness, that our scars are not there to be ashamed of. Our scars make us who we are. Jesus, in his resurrected body, has scars. There's going to be scars in heaven. You know that. And actually, we need to have the honest conversation. So what me and my wife did, we simply did a really simple thing. We just said, we're going to write a 12-week well-being program. We're going to train churches up across the UK, and we'll see if anyone wants to do it. And we, don't, we want them to do it in the church, but really what we want them to do is in the community. And we started in two of the most important places on the planet, Crewe and Chelmsford, where God lives. 
and we did it, and it was great. And then, and then a few more churches started to join in. And some churches, um, uh, before the pandemic, this map shows you where we were working. And, and, you know, they were amazing. They were going, oh, we could run this in a homeless hostel. Um, there was someone in Scotland who said, I'm going to run it in a hairdresser's. Because um, hairdressers are half therapist, half hairdressers, right? Tell them all the problems. And they started running it there. They started running it in schools and prisons and universities. And then COVID happened. And I'm like, we're completely and utterly doomed. <laughs> I'd like to be a bit of a drama queen. <laughs> it's never, never going to happen now. And my techie guys go, come on, guys. Let's put all the training online. Let's not give up. Let's keep thinking small. You know, maybe this is what the world needs at the moment. It's just people that are going to come alongside people, not to fix them, but to love them. And so we put all the training online and people started doing it all over the country. And, and I think it's because we were thinking not how do we change the world, but actually let's just think small. Let's think small. Let's think mustard seed. Think small doesn't mean you have to stay small, right? Because small things go viral very, very quickly. This is where Kintsugi Hope is working today. It's grown quite a bit in four years. Do not despise the beginning things. And you know, that's been the same with compassion this week, isn't it? Start with a child. Start small. And it isn't small, it's huge. Because we know they go, you know, David, an undersized shepherd boy, Gideon, he goes from 32,000 people to 10,000 people, down to 300 to defeat the Midianites. Jesus himself was born as a teenager in an obscure place. The smallest of people changes the world. Let's think small. When you sponsor a child with compassion, what you are really doing is standing with the church community, holding hands with some volunteers, with some carers and some parents and saying, I'm in it with you. I want to pray for your child and stand with you in the best way I can. And you then get to be part of this wraparound support package, which not only blesses that child, but it ripples out into the community, into their families. It really is an amazing gift and privilege to see how child sponsorship makes a difference. Um, there's a lot of talk about Asbury and the revival that's meant to be happening there. And I, I don't know much about it, but I do know that um, apparently it started with 19 people, just 19 people praying and not giving up and just carrying on. Think small. And then lastly, um, think differently. Here's a really good quote. I really like this quote. This is a good quote. Are you ready for this? Everyone talks about transformation, but no one wants to change. Every church leader is going, oh. You know, um, who here? Do you remember the black breed? Anyone here? Put your hand up if you had a black breed. Those, little, those tiny little keys. Do you remember those? And we you used to play worm on it, didn't you, when you were meant to be listening in church? No, was that just me? Okay. And, but the thing about the black breed is it was designed by a guy called Mike Lazarus. And what they did is they went up to all his team. They went up to Mike Lazarus and went, do you know what? I think, I know the BlackBerry is really, really popular, really popular phone. Everyone's using it in the business world, but I think we're going to have to change. And he refused to change. I love my BlackBerry. And, uh, and so they never changed. And he said to his team, do you know what? Tapping on glass is never going to take off. That is ridiculous. So the same, yeah, you know, different people. They went up to Steve Jobs and they said, um, Steve, um, I, we know you really love your iPod. Do you remember those little iPods? They were so small. <laughs> and we know you really love your iPod, but we've got another idea that we could put it all on a phone. And Steve Jobs said, no, nah, I like my iPod. I'm not sure. But go away, do some research and come back. And so they came back and they weren't stupid. You know, they went away and they talked about identity and values and they weren't throwing their baby out of the bathwater. They knew their things that we had to stand for. And I think that's the same with our faith. You know, we're not saying, ah, oh, we've all got to change this and change that. But actually, we've got to think about how we communicate. You know, Jesus was clever. He communicated through stories about fishing and farming and, and he communicated to his audience and he understood what it was all about. And so they came back and they persuaded Steve Jobs to give it a go. 
the iPhone now is accounted for um, a quarter of, sorry, a half of Apple's complete revenue. Who's got a BlackBerry? If you want to find your life, you need to lose it. We need to change. We need to think differently. You know, um, when I go to churches, I find it's really interesting that you go to the back of the church and there's normally a couple of maps. Normally there's a map with all the, um, where all the home groups are, you know, the life groups. And it always makes me laugh a little bit because they've always got the pictures of the life group leaders looking slightly scary saying, come to my home group, come to my home group. And, uh, and I know it's so you recognize the people in the church and all that sort of stuff. But then you've got another map where all the missionaries are which is great, it's fantastic. But I just wonder, and I know other people have said this before, it's not just me, is I wonder if we had a third map and this map was where everyone works. Um, the businesses, the hospitals, the schools, the university, where the cleaners, the porters, um, retail, performing arts, where mums hang out with their kids during the day, the coffee shops. And suddenly you look at the map and you think, oh my goodness, we have a lot of influence in this city. Wouldn't it be amazing if we started to pray for transformation of all those spheres? So it's not just what happens on church on a Sunday morning, it's what happens right across all these different sectors. We start to reimagine and it's about sharing our faith and that is so important, but it's not just sharing our faith, it's saying the gospel is so big, we want to see the whole of education transformed. Anyone like up for that? We're going to see change because we need to think differently. I want to show you a short video clip. It's literally 30 seconds. It's in German. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's of a granddad, and his granddaughter has bought him an iPad. Check this out. Sag mal, Papa, habe ich dich noch gar nicht gefragt. Wie kommst du denn eigentlich mit dem neuen iPad zurecht, was wir dir zum Geburtstag geschenkt haben? Gut. Mit den ganzen Apps kommst du klar? Was denn für Apps? Geh mal bitte einen Schritt zur Seite. So langsam. Was is? <laughs> See, the issue is, right, is you can use an iPad for that. You can do it. He did. But you are missing out on all the amazing things that an iPad can do. And can I humbly say, sometimes I feel like we have made personal salvation the gospel. It is so amazing, personal salvation. But the gospel is huge. It's got things to say to every sphere of society. It's not. It's about seeing people's lives transform from business to all sorts of different things. Now, I have to be really honest with you. Um, I've been on the theme group um, this year and thinking about the word flipped has really challenged me. And it was about a year ago now, and I was thinking about this whole flipped upside down kingdom. And I really felt God say, well, Patrick, you spend 90% of your time talking to Christians. What would it look like for you to spend it more like 50-50? And I thought, terrifying. <laughs> and, and when I prayed that, I was like, God, I'm up for it. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm up for it. You're right. I just talk to Christians all the time. As much as I love Christians, um, well, mostly, sometimes I can be a bit annoying, to be honest, but um, did I say that out loud? <laughs> but the thing is this. He said, what would it look like? And then after that, a business phones up and says, do you do corporate training? Um, yes, I do. <laughs> and, and they booked me. It was a communication company. Talk about starting um, with a bit of pressure. And then a school said to me, you know, um, we've just found a teacher in a burning car. I was wondering if you'd want to come in and talk to all our staff about mental health and well-being. And at the, at the same time, would you consider talking to our parents as well? And then the local prison said, would you um, be interested in us helping us? And suddenly I started realizing that this is such an amazing opportunity. So many people like me, we stay within the Christian world. And then I got really excited because the local homeless hostel rang me up. And this was a confirmation because it is a real privilege to speak at Spring Harvest. But this really got me going. I have to say they went, we've had a chat with the homeless guys and we've decided we want you to be our after fag dinner speaker. <laughs> Come on. I've made it in life. 
I can't wait, to be honest. I absolutely love that. I love it because no one knows you and they have to, you have to get their attention. You have to work at it. You know, you have to be a good communicator. I love the challenge of it. But the key is this, is every single one of us in this room, we're in full-time ministry. You know, you hear that phrase, don't you, about full-time ministry, that you're called into full-time ministry. Guess what? If you're alive and you're in this room, you're in full-time ministry. Doctors, nurses, teachers, mums, dads, grandparents, you're in a full-time ministry as anyone else, as certainly as me. And you know what? You have so much to offer. You are so have so much to offer. And I said this to my guys in my seminar, you know, sometimes I feel a bit of a fraud standing here on the stage because there's so much I could learn from you. Your life experiences, the human spirit is incredibly resilient. And, you know, we have got to be able to start dreaming bigger. In the words of the famous theologian, Winnie the Pooh, he says this, don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Walk beside me and be my friend. Flipped. Flipped. Upside down kingdom. Surrender it all. Think small. Think differently. And as we come into land, we think about Jesus, a saviour who healed the sick, raised the dead, loved the poor, the disenfranchised, set the captives free. A saviour who saw a woman who'd been abused by men and treated her with love and dignities. A woman who'd been scorned by society, but he gave her dignity, hope for today and for tomorrow. People with leprosy were healed, setting them free from stigma and loneliness. Restoration. Every time he embraced a child that everyone else thought was a waste of time, we see a glimpse of the kingdom of God. And so here's the key. Rather than simply hanging around on earth, doing our own thing, waiting to die and go to heaven, God calls us to partner with him in realising his ultimate purpose of recreating heaven and earth to be all that God creates it to be. We're called not to be puppets. We're called to be partners with God. These verses from Revelation tells us what heaven will be like. I saw heaven and an earth newly created. Gone the first heaven, gone the first earth, gone the sea. I saw holy Jerusalem newly created, descending, resplendent out of heaven, as ready for God as a bride for a husband. And I heard a voice of thunder from the throne. Look, look. God's moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone, crying gone, pain gone. All the order of the first things gone. And here's the punchline. Are you ready for it? God's ultimate intentions for human history are his intentions for us now. So until that day comes, we get on. We start to reimagine what education could look like. We don't have to do it in the big and the spectacular. We can think small. We can think tiny. But something is going to shift. Something is going to happen. We're going to start thinking differently. We're going to surrender our whole life to God and realizing it's not about us. It's never been about us. It's always been about him. And as we surrender, maybe our Savior is going to go, breathe. <laughs> it's okay. Do you know what? You're going to be all right. We're going to do this. I finish with this. Um, I used to have a PA called Ludivine. Um, she um, she was French. In fact, she's still French, I think. And um, she heard one of my talks once, and uh, she said, "Patrick, I've come up with a word for you." And I was like, "What's that, Ludivine?" And she said, "The word is flawsome." I was like, what does that mean? She said, Flawsome means an individual who embraces their flaws and knows they're awesome regardless. And I said, Ludovine, you can't just go making up words in this country. You know, we stick to the dictionary. It works really well for us. And my wife went, just Google it. You could do this when you get home. Google it. Flawsome. An individual who embraces their flaws and knows they're awesome regardless. Well, that's us. We're wounded healers. We go, we think small, we surrender our lives to God, and we think differently. Amen. Why don't we... Um... I'm going to pray and see what God wants to do. I know 
and time is going, but let me just pray. Father God, thank you so much for these beautiful, flawsome, amazing people. And God, we do get overwhelmed. We feel like we're drowning sometimes. We feel like life just feels like we're shouting out for help and no one is there. And Father, I thank you that you are so kind, that you come and you come to us and you say, it's okay, you're gonna be all right, breathe. You're good. And Father, all these people here living in such different spheres, such different experiences, going back next week to workplaces that are tough, workplaces that are amazing. But God, I pray they go back with a vision, with a dream of thinking small. What could possibly happen to see transformation in this place? For the exhaustion. If you are in education in any way at all, teacher teaching young people teenagers um i'm going off script here completely but could you just stand for me is that all right if you're in education hold on hold on hold on, hold on. i'm gonna do that in a minute so here's the thing i just feel really feel in my heart um Thank you. Thank you so much because you are under so much pressure. Um, you put in hours upon hours and I know other professions do as well. I'm not belittling in any other professions, but I just fed my heart for education. Thank you. Thank you for the hours that you do. Thank you for the times that you've gone further for that kid that everyone else has given up with. And I know that you're probably exhausted and you've come to spring harvest on your Easter holiday, you crazy people. But thank you. And I want to pray for you that you will be able to re-energize as you go back into doing what you're doing. Father God, I thank you for every single teacher, every single person in education, every single person here. God, I pray, revitalize them, I pray. Thank you, God, for them, for all what they do, for the young people, for children, for people that are working on the, uh, with children who are working on the margins with additional needs. God, we thank you so much. You are such a good God. And we pray, Holy Spirit, now that you would touch them and uh, by the power of your spirit, that you would fill them with the power of your spirit, Lord God, to go back, Lord God, re-energize, not through some hyped up thing, but just through the love and the compassion and gentleness of Christ. God, I pray that they would know that they are flawsome. They would know that they are loved. Hi, I'm Abby. And I love breakfast. I'm part of a team that looks after spring harvest. So is the camping good? No, because there isn't any. It's in chalets. Why? Because we like dry clothes and dry children. But seriously, worship? Yes. This is a week that could impact your family forever, providing an amazing space to have fun and bond, but also meet with God in new ways. Be inspired and grow through incredible teaching from the Bible and get refreshed, properly refreshed, physically, mentally and spiritually. There's something here for everyone with worship and workshops for all ages. This is the church coming together from across the nation to be together and worship the living God because it makes life better. How good is that? You've got that. The fairground, the shows, the pool, accommodation, restaurants, all the activities under the sun. And me, just waiting for you at the next Spring Harvest. And yes, there'll be plenty of corn, wheat and barley. <laughs>